All right. Um, oh, I'm getting an echo from, oh, there we go, okay. Um, so uh, today we have Benoit uh, presenting on um, kind of uh, counterbalancing goals um, in terms of peak performance versus um, generalizability in uh, data tiling that mall on CPU as a case study. So I uh, will turn it over to Benoit. Sorry. Is it me? Yeah, I think that's you. Do you, is your laptop um, logged in as a meeting participant instead of just presenting? Yeah. Oh wait, no, it's still happening even though your laptop is out now. Um, Maybe try uh, try ending the call uh, and logging back in. It, it was me, but basically I used the feature from inside Google Docs to share my tab, and that was my mistake. Ah. Um, because even though it didn't show me a mute m microphone icon, it was actually defaulting with to have the microphone on. So let me join in the normal way. Is this better? Yes, that's much better. Thank you. OK. Yeah, sorry. Take two, turning it over to Benoit. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, Roman. So I would like to know, sh should I aim for like th this ending in about 30 minutes by default, or do, do we want to take the full hour? Um, I think we have a few other things that are just uh, relatively quick discussions. Um, so if you've if you've got content for the full hour, um, or maybe let's say 45 minutes. Um, no, we'll, no, it's fine. Um, I think we but also, I think we can have some general discussion. Um, so kind of up to you. Yeah, OK. I'll try to finish a bit quicker. Um, so there's a general theme here uh, that I was uh, suggesting to Jack might be uh, useful to spend some discussion on. And that's like. How do we make a, a project like this tractable? What kind of trade-off do we make uh, with performance uh, to get tractability? And and like does it thought that these are not like four of our trade-offs and we are just like reshuffling the, the deck we've been handed, uh, the cards we've been handed to, so that the tractable things come first, we're not like forever foregoing performance, but like in the short term, we're still making hard choices. And like I'm anchoring this discussion on work I'm currently doing on data tiling Um uh, I don't I, like I, I I need that in order to get this concrete and to have something specific to say. That doesn't that doesn't mean that that's the single most important thing in the world. It's just whatever I've been currently working on and what's currently on my mind. Um, so I I started this slide deck. Uh, with a few slides on matrix multiplication so that I don't assume prior knowledge of this. Uh, it's okay if this sounds like too much detail and you mentally conclude, I just like skim through the slides. Uh, that's that's the point. Uh, there's no need to get into details, but there's a general theme that emerges from this, hopefully. So on this side, you have like a, a simple Im implementation in in C of matrix multiplication on row major 2D matrices. That's just to set the, the landscape to, so everyone uh, knows what we're talking about. Um, and so that's just a loop nest with three nested loops. So you're going to have M times N times K iterations overall. Sometimes we simplify this by assuming those three sizes are the same. So we say that N cube iteration. So there's N cube amount of work here being done on three matrices, LHS, RHS, and out, that are still, uh, each of them in square data. So that's more arithmetic work than data. This is arithmetically intensive. Um, so obviously you want to use vectorization and you want to use your CPU targets vector features, SIMD features, uh, to run this fast. Then that means you have to unroll those loops by some compiling constant amounts, which we call respectively M0 and K0. And that's going to depend on your SIMD ISA. 
And here's just a few examples. Um, and what's really hard here is you really want this to run at peak. And this is one of the few cases where peak is actually uh, within reach, so it's irresistible. Um, it's one of the few instances in matrix multiplication where when Intel says my, my hardware does one teraflop, it actually does with the right code. Um, so there's a very, very strong sense of like how fast these things should go. Um, but that also means that it's such a high bar. Your, your code needs to be spending all of its time saturating all of the arithmetic pipelines. And that means you have very little wiggle room to do all the other work you have to do to feed those arithmetic pipelines. Um, so I'm using a color code here. I'm, I, I, I always highlight blue as like instruction selection things, arithmetic work. And now in red, all what's about memory accesses. So what makes matrix multiplication extra hard is if we look at this naive math model on raw major matrices, look at just the left-hand side accesses. LHS stands for left hand side. Um, it's accessing M0 data streams concurrently. And by data streams, I mean like streams of contiguous bytes from memory. We've unrolled the loop on M by a factor called M0. And so now, like, we're, we're, we're reading at each loop iteration from M0 non contiguous addresses. Okay. And so we may be touching M0 cache lines. And remember from the Previous example, M0 might be something like 8 or 16. So if we are over the cache, the L1 cache associativity, then we are bound to run into trouble, although that may not be immediately apparent if we are lucky with the stride values. But if we want a math model to perform consistently well across all the problem sizes, then we are running into trouble already here. Now, if we look at the right hand side for this raw major math model, it looks a little different because now each loop iteration accesses N0 contiguous element, so that's fine. But the next loop iteration jumps by N. And so for large problem size, that means that it's impossible for the CPU to prefetch more than a few loop iterations into the L1 cache. Uh, and if we get even larger scale memory behavior of, of, of this loop nest, it's even harder because we have N cube work on N squared data. So each byte is accessed N times. Uh, and there's no way to reorder these loops to avoid redundant accesses. There's going to be some buffer access to, in a very redundant way, no matter how we order this. And so that's why people working on matrix multiplication keep talking about data cache, L1, L2, L3 cache. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a problem in general. So that's why I say it's really intractable by default. Like when you've been assigned Work on math model, you've been assigned an intractable problem, at least until you find a way to make it tractable, but then you're, go you're going to have to make some trade-offs. Yeah. Again, the color coding is blue is for like instruction selection kind of things, like code gen kind of thing, SIMD things, and red is memory performance. And you can see that even in the in terms of choosing your unrolling amounts M0, N0, K0, I I highlighted in bold uh some of these call for higher values and some others call for lower values. So if you're trying to solve for all these things at once, it's going to be messy. Uh, so how do we make this tractable? So how do we find a path where we don't have to solve for all these variables at once with conflicting goals? So we do that basically by accepting that at least in the near term, we're not going to have optimal performance. So some of the things that we thought we absolutely have to do, well, maybe we can we, we can uh, we, we can order these things so that the really hard problem come last. Um, and so the approach that I've been pursuing to this, which is nothing new, uh, we call it data tiling in the context of the compiler, but Papers on math model dating back to the go to paper 15 years ago have been calling that packing. It's nothing new, it's standard practice in this business. It consists in, in, in re layouting the matrices by some tiles, uh, by some tile layout, uh, so that the innermost loop of the math model 
performs trivial memory accesses. Only contiguous uh, data is read for, from the LHS and another contiguous data stream for RHS and that's it. And no, no internal swizzling is needed uh, to feed into the SIMD instructions. The data is already in memory in the exact layout that makes it really easy to load into SIMD registers. Uh, so that's what we call data tiny. And it does mean that the innermost loop uh, code chain problem is free of memory um, access considerations. Because like, even if I told you, your L1 cache size has this property, it's this size, you can't use this information. Your innermost loop is, it has got to traverse this, this data anyway, and the accesses are already trivial contiguous. So you can't do better than that. Even that does not make inner loop code gen necessarily tractable. It, it removes specific ways in which it was intractable. It lands you in a spot where it may be tractable or may not be depending on your specific performance goals and set of targets. So that's where we have a second tactic to, to further cement the tractability here. And that's what we call microkernel. And microkernel just says, um, I just provision for being able to throw in my own implementation, handwritten uh, code for this uh, enormous loop. So even if it's hard to, 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 to teach the compiler to generate this enormous loop, then I have this easy escape route. Um, we're pursuing both micro rules and pure cogen no micro rules in parallel, pragmatically uh, choosing between the two. Uh, so, the, the basically, to, again, this is only zooming in into my own work where I'm focusing on data tidying. I'm not claiming this is a universal uh, approach uh, uh, to MADMOL or even within ERI, but that's just the, the, the focus of, of this talk. So for me, choosing early to do data tidying unlocks a layered approach, where a, a layered approach where I can start from the inner uh, layers and walk my way uh, out um, to toward the, the outer layers. And at each layer, I only have a few variables to solve for, and I only solve for those variables. And when I move to the next layer, I never uh, have to solve again for those already solved variables. I only uh, incrementally solve for a few isolated variables at each layer. So we're going to go through this uh, uh, layers now. So the zero layer is decide to do data tiling. That's a compromise in itself. Data tiling means relayouting the matrices, and that means literally man copy style operations, buffer to buffer, memory to memory. Uh, you, you, you're spending some time if, before you can even get to uh, start doing matrix multiplication work. Now you have to spend some time performing buffer copies. Uh, which are actually significantly less efficient than memcopy because of the change of data layout. So that doesn't sound like a great way to, uh, to, uh, to uh, it doesn't sound like we've made progress at this point. We've just added more work to be done. So that's a trade-off. We're trading uh, away performance for tractability. The tractability uh, we, we get from enabling the whole layout approach and in more immediate terms, uh, this is what enables the inner loop cogen to deal with only trivial memory accesses. Uh, so that separates the vector cogen blue uh, aspect from the memory accesses red aspect. And well, the, the cost, the overhead we're introducing here is not that bad, depending on what you call that. It's in the five to 20% range, given good enough uh, pattern code. Um, which, you know, is, is something, but if it enables the whole thing to be tractable, then I'm willing to pay the price because in the end, I'd be happy to have eerie math models consistently go at 70% of peak. And this kind of overhead does not preclude getting that. And later, it may also actually evaporate. It's possible for packing and unpacking operations to get fused into producers and consumers in a way that they never actually have to be run it as their own discrete operations. Um, um, so moving up, 
to the next level. So at this point, we've decided to do data tiling. We're not, uh, again, uh, having to worry about that one. It's already an axiom at this point. So now at this level, okay, we know we are going to do data tiling. We must choose M0, N0, K0. Actually, you always vectorize with some specific uh, unrolling amounts. But with a data tiling approach, this is more crucial because now this is going to dictate your memory layouts. Um, so here we introduce a further uh, trade-off. We're going to say M0 and 0K0 for now are always going to be powers of two. That is a trade-off of additional performance because there's some uh, cases where actual optimal performance is achieved by number of two values. But sticking to powers of two here means there's so few choices that just read at the ISA specification tells you what values you should be using. You basically look at the SIMD instruction your kernel should be busy running in a loop and say, okay, how many of those can I put side by side, given how many registers I have? And well, if you add the requirement that you must have powers of two, then that basically narrows down to one possibility. We can always generalize later to non-powers of two. Just from now, this is a, a, a good compromise. And and so, yeah, the what we get in exchange for that is canonicality of a single choice, so we don't spend more time hesitating. And as someone who's been like maintaining a, a, a like stacks of neural network in France for a few years, I can tell you, in the past when we had like tile values of like twelve, we had people doing neural network architecture search saying, let's let's like make the next generation neural network super fast by empirically measuring what works best. Oh, like multiples of twelve were well, great. Let's let's design the entire neural network architecture around that. And, and then, you know. That, that scared me so much, I thought I'm never going to do a non power of two kernel again. Um, so next level. So at this point, we have selected the M0, N0, K0 tile size values. We know the data layouts, they are set in stone. Uh, the next problem we solve at this level is generate the code for the enormous loop. We have a fixed reference C implementation of that. The only question is what should be the SIMD implementation of that for uh, our target. And M0, N0, K0 have been selected to be optimally friendly to our target. So it's really a matter of use the right SIMD instructions. Um, it's really easy because data telling means that there's only one data stream being accessed and it's contiguous for each of left hand side and right hand side data. So you can focus purely on the arithmetic performance and your memory accesses are trivial. You have to make those memory accesses anyway, or nothing can do about it. Now, even with that, SIMD cogen is always hard. Um, it's hard partly because, well, SIMD cogen is hard in general, and partly because, especially on x86, due to weirdness of the SIMD ISA, your accumulator layout may be difficult, uh, uh, maybe non-trivial, and you have rewards for being able to have non standard uh, accumulator layout and differ from squeezing to the end and the beginning of the inner loop. And that means it's best to treat the whole loop as a, as a whole. And so you make that tractable by having the option of having micro kernels. We don't have to do everything with micro kernels, but when it gets hard in some specific case, we can always uh, short circuit this complexity with a micro kernel. And even with microcontrollers, it can get really hard because if you look at excellent back, which is a state of the art for like um, hand tuned assembly for 20 different variants of uh, our micro architectures, um, it's really hard to get peak on all micro architectures. Um, but if you are okay to focus on some recent micro architectures and maybe uh, not necessarily aim for a hundred percent of peak, then your assembly or your intrinsics actually uh, can be um, simpler and you need fewer variants. I didn't write anything for this slide because, you know, th this is just like a couple of four loops around the enormous loop, uh, not much to say here. The reason why it's kind of trivial is that the layer above that, level four, which we're getting to next, has as its job to select small enough tile sizes that this working set sort of fits in L1 or 
some more uh, general uh, version of that, but basically it's small enough that the um, memory accesses uh, don't need to be smart. So next level, select the dispatch tile sizes. And that's, that's the right place to talk about CPU's data caches, at least L1 and L2 at this level. So good thing that we've already we've already finished. We're already done talking about about what the type sizes should be. We're already done about uh, finding out what the code will be in our in our loops. We can now solve uh, for uh, these type sizes with at the input uh, the L1 L2 cache sizes uh, without having to seamlessly solve for cogen problems. And finally, you know, you you have your your dispatches. You decompose your model into a bunch of dispatches, which are each like computing this on tile of the overall problem. The question is, how do you iterate over those in a way that is, you know, memory local? That's why you talk about the L L3 cache, which which is typically shared among threads. And yeah, that's if you're going to distribute that work to multiple threads, that's also why you talk about that. And so, good thing that. We're already done with all the inner layers before we get to um, multi-threading and, and to shared cache. And well, that's all I had. And so sorry about the long monologue. Uh, um, I don't have anything, anything else. I hope that you have questions. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, um, like... Yeah, I have a question about uh, number four, number five. Um, yeah. I think I get a bit confused because we use the term dispatch to refer to um, thread, the amount of work that each thread is going to do. But here you're talking about caches, at least in level four. So yeah, can you clarify a bit uh, the difference between uh, tiling for caches and threading? Uh, yes, um, I, I may have misused the word dispatch. What I meant was, a, by dispatch here, I meant a call to the dispatch function. Like, so every compile generates functions called dispatch something, and they are called in some sequence, or the calls to these dispatch functions are distributed to different threads. And that's what I was calling a dispatch here. OK, that okay, makes sense. Thanks. Uh, and, and to the, the other part of your question, uh, it's kind of intentional that the multi-trading aspect is mixed with the large-scale cache L3 aspect because, well, like the question of how you iterate over those, how you move from one tile to the next, has to factor simultaneously those aspects in my experience. Like, as much as I am a fan of separation of concerns, yeah, I, I, I like the. I have not been able to disentangle these two aspects. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Are there are questions for Benoit. I can ask more questions, but prefer to wait. Please do. So yeah, you're thinking about. Um, you know, microkernels versus code generation thinking in a uh, F32 math mode, for example. So if if we apply um, data tiling and and all the steps that you have before generating the microkernel, I was wondering how different the, um, the instruction level is going to be if you compare, you know, you do all the blocking the same way, all the tiling the same way, and you compare the code that you generate with the microkernel and the code that we generate with code gen, um, how much is the the difference? What what do you what have you seen there? Yeah, um, this this is this depends on basically once you write what would be a reasonable microkernel for your target, it becomes quite obvious whether you're in a case where Kujan could do just fine or where there's a specific difficulty that Kujan would have to overcome. The cases that work just fine are first, the accumulator tile must, must have a trivial layout. Um, 
what I found in x86, for example, where um, synthesis results are only cheap if they are within 128 blocks, was that in order to avoid expensive results, I had to be smart with the accumulator layout. But then I thought, oh, wow, that is not going to be nice at all for cogen because now it's no longer like a nice 2D vector um, that abstracts the accumulator tile. Um, the other thing that can be hard for uh, cogen, but not impossible, is uh, loop pipeline optimizations. So often, uh, one achieves a substantial amount of extra performance by unrolling the inner loop by 2x and reordering uh, loads and stores around the arithmetic, uh, sorry, loads around the arithmetic uh, to um, maximize load to use distance. This is feasible in cogen, but not trivial. So it's a pragmatic uh, uh, time consciousness trade off. Um, and the other thing is because you, you specifically scoped your question with float32, but I was going to say um, float32 here is fairly easy for cogen because on current CPU targets, float32 implies you are doing an out of product kernel. Um, int8 already on current targets is typically not an out of product kernel. There's some inner reduction dimension that is uh, hard uh, for the compiler to target. The current MLIR vector lowerings don't do that well. Um, and the upcoming uh, ISA uh, extensions uh, bring that aspect also to F32. But like to the extent that uh, we are doing out of product kernels, which is the case currently with F32, then yeah, the it's not too difficult in general to, to code mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's why I mentioned uh, F32, because, you know, for example, if you want to use uh, BNNI, that's something that would be much more difficult for right. coaching, right? right? So then it's more like an instruction, so instruction scheduling kind of thing. You can be much more precise about how do you uh, um, organize instructions uh, for the inner, innermost loop. So, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, it's not even just VNNI that makes it hard for cogen. Um, the data layout uh, is actually the same regardless of VNNI on Intel because Intel had dot product instructions before VNNI. They are, like, VNNI brings both 8-bit and 16-bit variants. The 8-bit variant is unusable. Uh, and the 16-bit variant is basically like the existing instruction plus the multiply accumulate aspect. So it's a kind of minor uh, change for us, actually. It, it actually makes uh, nearly 2x uh, speed up which is nice, but the code is almost the same. And even without the NNI, we already have like 3D dot products with, uh, with uh, that requires like shuffles to target efficiently that are not uh, easy for the for cogen to get right. And on top of all of that, there is a generic problem with cogen for matrix multiplication kernels, which is um, to the extent uh, that we agree that um, matrix kernels generally need to be as wide as possible uh, given the number of CMD registers in the architecture. That means that they tend to be close to uh, maximum register pressure. Um, and that means they are generally fairly hard register allocation problems for the compiler. And so it's very frequent to follow that cliff and you know have performance diminished by an order of magnitude because uh, the compiler didn't find the right register allocation. Mm -hmm. This is very incidental. Um, that's why we are pragmatic. Like in, in some cases, uh, I'm, and, and actually, when we do microcontrollers, um, if we write it in intrinsics as opposed to assembly, then we are not actually uh, doing anything to address that problem. We still have the register allocation problem. Um, in, on, X, on x86 so far, I've written only intrinsic microkernels, um, taking a page from uh, my friends at Excellent Pack who did so. And if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. Um, not that they are actually happy with all the compilers handling of intrinsics, um, but straight off you, you make uh, it's nice not to have to maintain an extra thousand of line of assembly. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. Just today, I was uh, working with Ben and massaging uh, um, uh, MSVC to produce a good outcome out of our intrinsic kernels.
I, I, I feel that I probably um, like zoomed in too much on my current work on data tiling in math models because I really wanted to anchor this on something that was fresh in my mind. Uh, but I, I, I was hoping that some general, uh, general picture would emerge about like, how do we approach a hard software problem and make it tractable? I have this metaphor in my mind of we're handed um, a deck of cards. It's mixed. There's like, I imagine that like um, high value cards uh, are like really hard problems and low cards are easy problems and it's all mixed. And if we go in order, we can easily get stuck at the first hard card that we run into. So it's important to reorder our deck of cards so that the right things come first. Um, and so that's why, you know, when I say we're making trade-offs between performance and tractability, it's kind of temporary. It's, it's more accurate to say we, we are reordering this so that tractable things come first, even that, if that means that we are not aiming for peak performance first. Um, but if, like that, that, that only allows us to eventually get to the place that, where it would be the right time to look at the harder problems. At least we don't have to solve the, all the hard problems at once before we get anything up and running. Uh, the, the lack, the lack of <laughs> discussion following this presentation is a strong suggestion that I got something wrong in the in, in the scoping of what I presented. Uh, so that should be a, even more of an invitation for anyone to share uh, their thoughts or propose a better conversation topic. We'll have um other questions about this or um, other topics? There are a couple of other things um, that we wanted to point to, um, but I'm going to leave it open for a moment. Um, OK, well, thank you, Benoit. Um, next week, we're planning to discuss an RFC from um, Nod uh, about uh, heterogeneous device usage in Erie. Um, so just that's a, a teaser for that. I actually can't find the link right now. Um, someone has that link and could post it in the chat. That would be very helpful. Um, but we want to make sure uh, that we have Ben around for that, and he is out today. So going to hold off on discussion of that. Um, the other um, thing on the agenda was, thank you, Taya. Um, uh, it was just a note on coding style. Um, this is kind of getting into the details of, of developer stuff, but um, we have historically used um, Google formatting for all our code base in Kling format. Um, and in the compiler, we've used LLVM style. Um, that was kind of just uh, a necessity based on being a source of truth in Google's monorepo, um, like the way that Kling format is configured there. Um, and we really recently had this realization that we're kind of in a weird state. Um, and so we are considering uh, and, and planning to switch to using LVM style um, for all of our, or sorry, LVM formatting for all of our uh, compiler stuff that's already in LVM style. Um, and also, there's one place of difference in terms of recommendations around braces that we like braces around single line if and for statements that we're probably going to, we're probably going to just stop commenting on that. Um, but uh, yeah, so basically, yeah, trying to unify with LVM. Um, if people have any concerns about that for some reason, um, I will likely change the Kling format files, run Kling format over everything, and then add it in the like git boring commits dot text or whatever that's called. Um, but just so people are not surprised. Um, I think that was it for the official agenda. Are there other topics? Um, that people wanted to bring to the community. All right. Well, um, I don't have uh, 20 minutes of jokes to tell, so I think um, unless there's there's anything else, we can end early. All right. Thank you, everyone. Figure out how to stop the recording here. <laughs>